Good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. We are going to wrap up the book of Acts today. We have just a little chapter and a half to get through. So let's go ahead and share our screen, make sure the chat is open. If you're online, feel free to pop up in the chat. Okay, so we left off right before the shipwreck. Paul's on this ship that is being sent over to Rome. He's transferred boats. On this boat, they are going against recommendations because it is not the season to be sailing. Winds are high. Everyone's afraid. It seems like the people on the boat have taken a vow not to eat until they are to safety. But Paul has to intervene and say, listen, I've had a vision. We're all going to be okay. You all need to eat and protect yourselves because you're going to starve to death if not. And so he convinces everyone to eat. They eat. They throw leftover supplies after their meal overboard as a way to make the ship lighter and an attempt to not crash. But crash they do. Paul says that this is coming. So this is where we left off the shipwreck. In the morning, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore if they could. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, they loosened the ropes that tied the steering oars. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. Do we have any sailors here? Does this make sense to anyone what they're doing? We'll take their word for it that they know what they're doing. But striking a reef, they ran the ship aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable. The stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them might swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land and the rest to follow, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Just a fun sociological tidbit. I don't know what percentage of people in the ancient Roman Empire were capable of swimming. Some know that skill. Probably people who had wealthier leisure time were part of the gymnasium, had opportunities to engage in learning how to swim. Others don't know. So everyone who can swim, jump overboard now. The rest of us, we're going to figure out how to get to land using these planks to get to safety. So the centurion is looking out for Paul and prevents all the prisoners from being killed. Comments or questions about that little passage? Okay. Final chapter. After we had reached safety, when we learned that the island was called Malta, the local people showed us unusual kindness. Since it had begun to rain and was cold, they kindled a fire and welcomed all of us around it. Paul had gathered a bundle of brushwood and was putting it on the fire when a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the local people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, this man must be a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were expecting him to swell up or drop dead, but after they had waited a long time and saw that nothing unusual had happened to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Now in the vicinity of that place were lands belonging to the leading man on the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It so happened that the father of Publius lay sick in bed with fever and dysentery. Paul visited him and cured him by praying and putting his hands on him. After this happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They bestowed many honors on us, and when we were about to sail, they put on board all the provisions we needed. All right, so they 
land on a pretty major island, the island of Malta. The local people there show kindness to them, and we get this story involving a viper. So there is an ending to the book of Mark that is added on to it at the end, later by scholars. So the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, ends with the women visiting the tomb and running away in fear. And that was the ending of the original manuscript that we have. And so later on, scribes thought to themselves, this isn't a good ending to the story. I think today we can talk about how it's actually a really cool ending. These women, the first witnesses to the tomb, run away. They now have the opportunity to tell the story on their own terms. They're writing the ending with their own testimony. We know that they told someone, obviously, because here we are today. Uh, but these scribes later decided that there needed to be more added to the story. And they added a very strange passage in which it says that those who have faith will be able to handle snakes and not be harmed. Um, so this is a, an addition to scripture. We know from tracking our earliest manuscripts, this shows up much later. It's not part of the original manuscripts. But this is where you get something like Appalachian snake handling, that there are American religious communities that take that verse very literally. And in their religious ceremonies, they practice handling poisonous snakes. And so here we have potentially inspiration for that passage. Perhaps the scribe knew of this uh, moment from Acts where a viper bites Paul and he's not harmed. We see that the local folks, their religious practice runs across this spectrum where it's kind of bad things happen to bad people and good things would happen to good people. So you're bit by a snake. Obviously, this means you're a murderer. Justice has been served. Makes me think of the Final Destination movies. Your fate, you can't escape it. And now here you are being bitten by the snake. So here they're ready to, to think of him as a murderer. But the moment that he's not armed, well, all of a sudden he's a god. So they kind of jump to these extremes of how they understand the world. This is not unusual for a lot of people operate today. Yeah, Chris. Ooh, great question. So Chris says, do we want to think back to the serpents in the garden? And here is Paul impervious to the penetrations of the snake. Um, there is actually a lot within scripture that you can do with snake imagery um, because you have, of course, the Garden of Eden scene. You later have this retelling of the garden scene in the Gospel of John where Mary Magdalene is in the garden and Jesus is set up as kind of a new snake um, in this garden scene. And in the vein of there's this story from the Old Testament where all of these people as punishment by God are bitten by poisonous snakes. And Moses prays to God for them to be healed. And God's instructions to Moses are to create a pole with a bronze serpent wrapped around it and to hold it up. And anyone who looks to the snake will be healed. And this is where we get kind of the basis for the imagery of the Caduceus, um, where we have the, the medical imagery for, for healing, or the rod of Asclepius is another name for it. Um, and so Jesus being lifted up on the cross is supposed to serve as a new form of Moses's pole with the serpent. So there's all of this where there, the scripture actually plays with the ideas, the serpent bad is the serpent good. Um, but I think that's a really great observation here that Paul um, is being struck by the snake, but yet with no repercussions because he has this new salvific power from Christ. So yeah, I think absolutely you can play with that imagery. Other comments or questions? That was just kind of a quick overview of snake imagery in scripture. Did all that make <laughs> sense or any questions about what I said? All right, so they're given a new boat. They're about to set sail. It's going to be a long journey. Three months later, we set sail on a ship 
that had wintered at the island, an Alexandrian ship with the twin brothers as its figurehead. So Castor and Pollux or Romulus and, um, let's see, this probably would have been Romulus, right? Well, uh, we put in at Syracuse and stayed there for three days. Then we weighed anchor and came to Regium. After one day there, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Putu Putioli. There we found brothers and sisters and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters from there, when they heard of us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. When we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. So he's still being given special privileges as someone who probably his reputation precedes him. This prisoner is not guilty, but he has claimed that he wants to be heard in Rome and probably he has some sort of following so they don't want to rile up local people either. Three days later, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. This is Paul. When they had assembled, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, yet I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. When they had examined me, the Romans wanted to release me because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to the emperor even though I had no charge to bring against my people. For this reason, therefore, I ask to see you and speak with you, since it is for the sake of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They, have, they replied, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken anything evil about you. But we would like to hear from you what you think, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. All right, so some interesting facts about what messages have spread or not spread. Paul gathers together, oh, go ahead, Donna. Oh, great question, probably not. There probably wouldn't have been that many ships coming from Malta to Rome, so they wouldn't have heard these healing stories. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Doesn't seem like the Jewish community knows very much. Yeah. So Paul gathers together the local leaders. He's wanting to... Let them know that he's part of the community. He hasn't done anything to harm the community, despite what they may have heard. But he finds out that they really haven't heard anything. They tell him, no one has come up from Judea to tell us anything. We haven't received any letters. It makes sense because for Paul to get from Judea to Rome himself has been this very harrowing journey. So it wouldn't make sense for someone else to have gotten there before him to bring this message, but they haven't heard anything. But what they have heard is that in other parts of the world, this sect of followers of Jesus doesn't have a good reputation. And so people are speaking against it. And so they would like to know for themselves, what is it that these people are preaching? And so I think we talked last week that getting to Rome is kind of a way to set up that Paul gets this final sermon, or we have come to the ends of the earth, the great commission, that the gospel will be preached in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we're getting to the ends of the earth, Rome itself. And so Paul now has the opportunity to preach in Rome. After they had set a day to meet with him, they came to him at his lodgings in great numbers. From morning until evening, he explained the matter to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he had said, while others refused to believe. So they disagreed with each other, and as they were leaving, Paul made one further statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah, Go to this people and say, You will indeed listen, but never understand. 
and you will indeed look but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise they might look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Let it be known to you then that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Why is he allowed to? Why the charity at that point? Yeah, like why would this he continue to preach to folks who aren't listening? Yeah, great question. So Paul gathers the Jewish community. What's interesting here is that Paul is giving this last sermon in the book of Acts to the Jewish community rather than an account where we've got an account of him delivering his sermon to Festus and to Felix and to um, all of, of these Roman government officials. But yet Paul never gives up hope that this message is also for the Jewish people. And so wherever he goes, we see him coming back to the synagogues, coming back to the Jewish people. This is a message for his community. And so despite the fact that every city he goes to, he experiences both acceptance and rejection, Paul doesn't give up. Here in Rome is his chance to speak to the Jewish community in Rome, which would have been still a, a big Jewish community. And so he wants, I think, to preach this message, knowing that not everyone's going to accept it. And so we get this final explanation as for why, and, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but we are told that some are convinced by what he said. So it's not a complete loss. Some were convinced, others refused to believe. That's been his experience in every city that he goes to. So then we get this quotation from the prophet Isaiah. It's one that Jesus repeats in the gospels. And so this is part of the call story of Isaiah, where Isaiah is called to go to the people of Israel and proclaim this word that they must repent and turn back to God. And God informs Isaiah that he's going to meet resistance. And so perhaps this is an explanation as to why did the message of Jesus not proliferate at a greater speed or to more people? How is it that so many people were unwilling within the Jewish community to understand Jesus as the promised Messiah? And so the explanation here is that this has been part of the work of God since the prophet Isaiah, that not all people are going to believe, that some will hear, but their ears, their eyes, their hearts will be shut. They'll receive the message, but not understand it. So Jesus speaks in this way in correlation to the parable of the soils, where seeds are planted, but not every soil is ready to receive the word. An explanation for why some of these people aren't listening. But the seeds continue to get planted or thrown out. It's also an explanation as to why the message goes beyond the Jewish community. So this is an, a reiteration again at the end of Acts that this message is not just for the Jewish community, but it's meant for anyone to believe, Gentiles as well. And then finally, we're told about these two years in which Paul's living in Rome and proclaiming the gospel without hindrance. Paul, you had a great question last week of whether the author knew about what happened to Paul. And, and we said probably, but chooses not to end his writing in this way. Um, he doesn't want to end with Paul's death. He wants to end the story with this idea that um, the message is proclaimed without hindrance. Other books are going to pick up the question of what happens when you know, Jesus doesn't come back right away or what happens in the face of persecution. But that's not where this story ends. All right, questions or comments about the ending of Acts? Yeah, Donna? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it does say um, at his own expense and his own rented dwelling. So that's a really good question. Did he have enough freedom to have a prison trade? You now we know he's a tent maker and he um, earns money that way as he's traveling. So was he able to do that while he was in prison? I don't know. Does he have resources with him? That seems unlikely that he would have been traveling with that much money. It would have not been unusual for people to come and give him resources, but it does say at his own expense. So yeah, I'm not quite sure. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, is he healing and people are giving him compensation? That was Donna's question. Yeah, there is. We, we've talked about how there's a whole vocation within the ancient world, a professional healer. So people would go around healing and being paid for it. So um, we get other stories where people attempt to pay the disciples for their healing and they reject it. So I don't know. Yeah. Todd? Is there a significance to how um, Acts gives a little bit greater detail about some things and then it's like and two years later, and it seems some reason or is this historical? Or yeah. Just yeah, yeah. Great question. Todd asks Is there a reason why we have these moments that go into great detail and then we have other moments that say, and two years later, it's the same in the Gospels where whole chunks of Jesus's life are missing from the historical record. So the main explanation for that is the genre of these stories or writings doesn't privilege um, detailed historical accounting. So if we were writing a biography about someone today, you get biographies where there's 12 volumes and one volume is, you know, 1936 to 1938, two years of a person's life. And so we privilege that a lot more today in terms of biography. But at the time, this writing isn't meant to serve as biography. It has a theological purpose. This writing is meant to explain what happened in the early church. And so Luke is making decisions about what the important stories are. The conversion of Paul is repeated multiple times. That's an important story. The message itself, the what's called the kerygma or the, the spoken word, the preached word, that is important. And so that's why we have all of these sermons highlighted again and again and again. So it's meant for a theological purpose rather than a historical purpose. Great question. Paul? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for naming that. Yeah, go ahead. I have to make the same observation because we are saying that Israel won't listen, but then how we will listen. Even so, though the Jews may accept it. Yeah. So, what is this written in relationship? This is the seeds of the early Christian. So, I just, what is it written in relationship to Jesus actually? Yeah, yeah. Two good observations and questions. So first, just to address the anti-Semitism within the text. Um, it is really important to name that and to be careful when we're reading both the Gospels and Acts because it very much within our English translations um, even makes it worse because of the way in which that phrase, the Jews, has been used in anti-Semitic ways. But the text kind of creates this term for the Jewish community 
And this is the seeds for a lot of anti-Semitism, also within the Gospel of John, where there's often this um, tension between Jesus and the Jews. So we have to be really careful with that as we're reading to understand that folks at this time would have not understood the Jewish community as a monolith, that the writers themselves understand themselves to be Jewish. So it's not the Jews versus us because they are Jewish and they're trying to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. It, it, understanding it as a critique from within the community. Now, Luke would have been Greek himself, not ethnically Jewish. Um, we would have uh, understood Luke to probably have been what was called a God-fearing Gentile in that he was probably converted to Judaism or practicing Jewish practices. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. Like there's no explaining it away. It says, this is why they don't believe. And, and this is why we're taking it to the Gentiles. So absolutely. Uh, and it is disturbing. Yeah. Uh, your question was, when is this written in relation to Jesus? So just kind of a rough timeline of the writings of the New Testament, the very earliest writings that would have been put down onto parchment would have been the early letters of Paul that would have been written um, in the 40s, 50s AD. So we're looking at Jesus being crucified, you know, 30s AD, these letters coming out 30s, 40s, 50s. So shortly after Jesus is crucified, we get Paul writing to these communities that he has established. The Gospels themselves aren't written down. They would have been spoken orally and passed within communities, but they're not written down until after 70 AD. The reason why that dating is that the Gospels seem to know about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so that's a really significant marker for scholars trying to date these texts is the Gospel writers know that Jerusalem has been destroyed which would have been further impetus to put down in writing the gospel story. Um, so we also know that Mark would have been the first gospel written because Matthew and Luke both copy the gospel of Mark chunks word for word. So there are parts of Matthew that are unique to Matthew, part of Luke that are unique to Luke, and then parts of Matthew and Luke that are word for word the same as Mark. So if Mark's written shortly after 70 AD, Matthew and Luke probably around 80, 80, 80. So we're looking at 50 years after the death of Jesus. Um, are you talking about Paul specifically or? Yes, he did. Um, so when he was put to death, he was an, an old guy. Um, and he isn't put to death until 93 AD. Um, and so, yeah, he's older. Um, so his missionary journeys are, are quite extensive. Who are writing about Paul? Uh, the year of his death? Oh, yeah. I mean, so there, there, there are mythologies about where the disciples went that aren't necessarily verified yet. Um, so, you know, the question of how did Christianity get to India? Well, Thomas is the one who traveled to India. So we have these, these stories, but not necessarily verifiable. Yeah. I'm just going to do a quick fact check on myself. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I was way off. I didn't, it didn't sound right when it came out of my mouth. Um, so 62 to 64 AD is when Paul's put to death. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments just about this last passage from Acts? All right. Let's just do a quick overview of Acts as a whole as we come to the end of another book. So Acts is intended for us to get a taste of the seeds of the early church, for us to know how it went from this message of Christ who dies, resurrects, and then ascends, and so is no longer bodily with us. So what comes next? And this is the story of what comes next. If you remember at the beginning, we talked about how the central character of Acts is not Paul or Peter, it's the community itself. How do you form a community that carries on the message of Christ? And so we get these details of how the community struggles and forms. There's a lot of complications. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of squabbling. We get people who are aligning themselves with certain leaders as opposed to other leaders. And so those human elements creep in. We get where the community is gathering for the Eucharist, and yet only the wealthy who are able to provide their own food can eat, and so they need to be chastised that they should be feeding the poor as well. We get this grand vision in Acts chapter 2, verse 44, of the disciples sharing everything in common with one another, and that's kind of the ideal where no one goes without and yet they never actually reach the ideal as a community, which is why we get these problems that come up. But it's meant to be a story where the community is the means by which the message and the love of Christ continues to be given to the world. What do you all make as we conclude Acts of the role of the community in the Christian faith. What do you believe the role of the community is today? Yeah, Chris, what were you gonna say? You don't have to answer that question. Hmm. Yeah. No, I have actually never thought of the community as you know the foretold second coming of Christ. Um, that's a really interesting thought, but I like that, that you could argue, Chris said that here is Christ's return in the form of the community that has persisted across thousands of years. Yeah. So Donna just saying, you know, the beginning of this religious tradition focusing so much on law that that focus can occlude our understanding of love because love transcends the law or love is the essence of the law, perhaps, but yet creates this bigger picture for us. And so how does a community and this is something communities wrestle with today. How do we go above the law into a law of love, perhaps? Yeah, yeah Carol Lee? Yeah, yeah. Um, Carol Lee says, you know, just as at this time, Today, some believe, some don't, some get along, some fight. The reality of community hasn't changed all these years later. I'm curious, at the end of the, the story, when it says, you know, some believe, some didn't, and there's this passage from Isaiah, 
um, to, to explain why some people hear the word, but their hearts are hardened. And it says the Gentiles are going to believe, but of course we know that most Gentiles don't. Um, do you feel like the book of Acts is comfortable with the idea that not everyone believes? Is there some tension there, or is that just part of the reality of community life? Not everyone's going to believe, not everyone's going to get along. Yeah, so the more Paul travels, the more adversity he faces. Yeah. Go ahead, Todd, and then we'll come over to Paul. Hmm. Yeah, evangelism. So hmm. interesting. Yeah. Um, Todd's seen this tension between being okay with diversity, that there's people within the community that disagree with each other theologically, and yet there's also this propulsion towards evangelism, spreading the good news. Um, now, Paul's missionary tactics look a little different than some of the colonial tactics that were about saving the savages, um, using that terminology. Paul's missionary tactic seems to be to speak to people in the lingo they understand and to incorporate their previously held beliefs into an understanding of who Jesus and God is already in their life. Um, so yeah, that's a, a great question of what evangelism looks like or what you know, missiology, mission work looks like. Yeah, definitely that tension there. Did they, I think that they are drawing from Acts and putting new interpretations on it. Yeah, but it's good to, you know, have this time to read through the source text, right? We're reading through this and all these sermons about Jesus don't say anything about substitutionary atonement. Jesus died to satisfy the wrath of sins. We talked about that a lot as we've gone through Acts. That's a major theological understanding for the majority of modern day Christians. And yet here we are reading scripture and being like, whoa, wait a minute, this isn't in the original text. So it's good for you to identify that Paul's mission work looks a little different than what it ends up looking like. Um, so as we compare reality to scripture, there's always disconnect. Paul? Yeah, I, Mike, I'm just wondering out loud whether the community was okay with the fact that not everyone believed. Seems like Isaiah was. They still do their work despite knowing that. The idea of Jesus instructing them to shake the dust off their feet and go to the next town. Go ahead, Paul. We can change topics, too. I love that, Paul. And let's let's end on that note. So um, before we dig with that, anything else anyone wants to say, though, about what you're taking from the book of Acts after our study of it? OK, well, let's take this as kind of our last point. And I think that's beautifully said. And that is a lot of what scripture is wrestling with. We have Paul and Peter and the other disciples spreading this word about Christ. And when they come, they say, listen, this is not a new religion. This is nothing new. This is what God has been doing throughout the history of our ancestors. And so this message is one that takes into consideration all of our past, 
We've all been coming to this moment. And yet at the same time, it is an opportunity to do something new as a community to say, where is God or where is the message of Jesus taking us next? Who are the new people who are going to be part of this? And when those new people come on board, what can we do to make this look more like the kingdom of God? How can we share our resources? How can our community develop and to become a more just and equitable society? They're wrestling with these questions in the book of Acts. And these are questions that we wrestle with today. And so I think what we get from the book of Acts is just a testimony to the fact that the spirit of God is at work in the midst of community, but that community is very real and very human. And so we would be foolish to think that our community is ever a full reflection of God. And yet we are invited to take all of our past and to always be asking as people of faith, what is the new thing God is doing in the future? And that is the only way that the church universal can continue to propel itself. We see um, within scripture, this entire theme of there is no life without death. There's no resurrection without something being planted. And so we take the past into consideration, but we're always looking for the ways in which something dies and something new is resurrected. And that's what the book of Acts is about. Christ dies, but not only is Christ resurrected, but the church itself is resurrected in a new way. And so that's exciting. Come in, we're wrapping up. Um, so, uh, my prayer as we, we conclude with Acts is just that we too can be people of resurrection, um, to be a church of resurrection where we take all that has come before us and we continue to bring new life in new ways. And so I'll just say amen to that. Um, here's our schedule for this, which is, um, next week, Jen and I will be out of town. So no Bible study. Um, the week after on August 4th, our speaker is actually here. Hey, Bob. <laughs> um, Bob is, um, what's your official title? Therapist, psychoanalyst, psychologist. Thank you for um, correcting me. So Bob is a psychologist who's going to be speaking about one of his um, areas of focus, which is religious trauma. And so there's actually a diagnosis about religious trauma. And so I think it's gonna be a really fascinating discussion a lot of folks in this church I know who've experienced religious trauma. And so that will be the topic on August 4th. And we're looking forward to that. All right. Thanks, everyone. What will be the next book? Yeah. Any, in, any input on that? I've been kind of keen to go to Genesis. Anyone, are people good with that? Okay, cool. All right, so maybe Genesis. Thank you. Yes, of course. Yes, thank you. Bye, online folks.